Welcome to Gold Hill. Today is the 25th of October. The year is racing by. But we're so glad that you could join us this morning, wherever you are and whatever time of day you are listening to us. We're going to start off um, our service this morning by um, watching a video of a baptism. Um, a lady called Irene Webb, who is one of our um, members in one of our gatherings, um, has taken that decision to be baptised, to make that outward declaration of an inner reality that has been hers as she's found Jesus Christ as her saviour. So before we do anything else this morning, let's watch that baptism. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for Irene. I pray your blessing on her and your goodness, your, your celebration over her this afternoon. Thank you for the, the almost said many years of her life. That might have been rude, but thank you for the years of her life as she celebrates her birthday today. I thank you that we get to celebrate that with her. But I thank you even more, God, that we get to celebrate her baptism today and what that means and um, her faith and love of you. I pray that you'll help her as she shares her story later on and also help us um, focus in on you and reflect on the things that are said, whether we know you well or whether we don't know you very well at all. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to ask Irene three questions. The first question is, how did she get into all of this? And, and Jesus and church and things. Second question, who is Jesus for her now? And third question, anything else she wants to share? Cool. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Do, um, do you want to look at them? Yeah. Thank you. They're good <laughs> looking lot. Yeah, oh, they're lovely. Yeah, thank you. Um, I always felt that someone was always looking after me, um, uh, after me. But my faith, uh, my faith was rediscovered when I went with my my late son, son-in-law, who was very sick, um, and we went um, uh, took me to, on Christmas Day uh, with him to the Rock Church. Uh, church and after that I returned to the church every Sunday when I learned more about Jesus I grew in my faith that's cool okay so who is Jesus for you now so that was six seven years ago yeah so now seven years on or six years on who is Jesus for you now um, after this, a few years later, later when I started at the Hope Church, I, I, re, um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. The Lord gave me so much confidence and faith to cope. I never doubted I would get over this, as he was always with me, and he did get me through. Well, thank you. And anything else you want to share at all? I have a very loving family now, a family, and now I have the Hope family too, which God has sent me. Cool. Thank you. Should we give her a round of applause? <laughs> now, normally when we do baptisms, we um, physically... Put them under water. Um, but what I Irene's going to do is she's going to, to put herself under after I've asked her a question or two and then we'll pray for her. Um, so if you want to stand, then that's fine. If you can see where, you're, where you are, then that's fine. It's being recorded so people can see as well. Irene, I'm going to ask you a question. Before I do, I want to share one verse. Can I make it two? So the first one was the verse that everyone remembered. Let's see if they know it. To all who believe and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. In a, a letter that the same John wrote, he said, how great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we can be called children of God, and that is what you are. Yeah. So, Irene, my question is, have you turned and believed in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? I have. Do you want to say it into the microphone? I have, definitely. Yes. Thank you. There we go. 
No, don't, don't worry. So on confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. blessing on her. I thank you that you love her. You have made her a new creation. Thank you that she is your daughter. She's a daughter of the, the God of heaven and earth. I pray your blessing on her, your strengthening of her, and I pray that your Holy Spirit fills her afresh every morning with joy and hope and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well done, Amazing. well done. Shall we help you out? <laughs> Wonderful. It's so good to see somebody actually uh, taking that step. And actually it's a command from Jesus that when we believe, we should be baptised. If you're a believer in Jesus and you haven't yet decided to be baptised, then could I really encourage you to think about that again? And uh, we're here at the church if you want to find out more about what it actually means to take that step um, in your Christian life. You can either um, phone the church or contact us on our website and the details should be up on the screen. So we're going to move into a time of worship now. Let us quieten our hearts and maybe close your eyes. If you're sitting at home, that's so easy to do. Just focus on God, on his majesty, on the wonderful nature of God, our Heavenly Father. Thank him afresh for Jesus. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and help you really engage with worship. I know it might not be quite the same when we're not all together in one place worshipping God together, but God knows our hearts and he hears our worship and he accepts our worship. Let me pray for us. Father, help us just to come before you in this next um, few minutes to really settle our hearts and focus our minds on you. Thank you, Lord, for our worship team who have met and put together this music to help us to really come into your presence in some worship. I pray, Lord, that you would meet with each of us as we worship you now in our own homes. Amen. Let our praise be your welcome Let our songs be a sign We are here for you We are here for you Let your breath come from heaven Fill our hearts with your life We are here for you We are here for you To you our hearts are open Nothing here is hidden your fire fall down let us shout be your anthem your renown fill the skies we are here for you we are here for you Let your word move in power Let what's dead come to life 
We are here for you We are here for you To you our hearts are open Nothing here is hidden You are our one desire Let your fire fall down to you, our hearts. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy, God. Let your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. No mighty God of love be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. No mighty God of love be welcomed in this place. And let every heart adore. Let every soul awake in Almighty God of love be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. In Almighty God of love be welcomed in this place. And we welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. In Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. And we welcome you with praise. Yes, we welcome you with praise. In Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. So well. Kissed a guilty world in love. 
thy truth thou dost direct me by thy spirit through thy word and thy grace my need is meeting as i trust in thee my lord of thy fullness thou art pouring thy great love and power on me without measure full and boundless drawing out my heart to thee who is love will not remember who can cease to sing my Jesus, my Savior. Sing for joy. 
My Jesus, my Saviour, Lord, there is none like you. How true that is. We're going to move on in our service now and we welcome Steve Pendray, who is part of our preaching team. And he's going to be unpacking the parable of the Good Samaritan, a very familiar passage um, in the Bible. So let me just uh, pray for Steve as we move into that time of listening to God's word. Father, we thank you for the uh, joy of sung worship and we also thank you for your word that we can learn of and learn from every day of our lives. And we thank you for Steve and for the gifting that you've given him, the passion you've given him for your word. And Lord, I pray now that we will um, be enabled by your spirit to really have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that are open to receive your word and to live out your word in our daily lives. Lord, we lift Steve to you this morning. Bless him now, I pray, anoint him. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're continuing this morning a series called Don't Settle for Normal or Don't Settle for New Normal. It's to do with uh, coming back to our normal activities following lockdown. Are we just going to revert to life as it was before or is this an opportunity to rethink the way we behave and uh, maybe some of our habits? Habits are deeply embedded into our behaviours. We learn them at an early stage of life and then they just we just do stuff without actively thinking about it. Um, I was looking at the Highway Code recently, so I read that first maybe 40 years ago when I took my driving test. And if you ask me, do I obey it? Yes, I obey the Highway Code. Even though when I looked at it recently, I couldn't remember a word of it. It's just embedded in the way I drive. And we're looking today at a story that's embedded in our culture. It's a story that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. And all through our culture, we, we hear of people playing the Good Samaritan, or we see hospitals named the Good Samaritan Hospital. But is it a bit like the Highway Code? We know that there's a story, but when did we last read it? When did we last study it and think about what it really means? So we're going to read that story together now. It's a story Jesus told, and it was documented by a man called Luke, who just a few decades after Jesus uh, told it, he... he, he um, he quizzed the people who were there and he wrote down uh, what, what they told him. So it's a very reliable account of the story that Jesus told. And it's designed as a story within a story. So let's read it now. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, but when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, 
and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So as I said, this is a story within a story, which is a, a literary device that I really enjoy. Uh, and the inner story is, is a story Jesus made up to illustrate a point. It starts by a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, now that would have been familiar to everyone listening to the story. It's a, a journey of about 13 miles, but it's a very, very steep downhill journey. Jerusalem is 3,000 feet up and Jericho is 800 feet below sea level. So it would be the equivalent of, of walking down Mount Snowdon. And the road at that time wasn't paved. It was, it was more a path, it was very steep uh, and, and quite treacherous. And there were lots of caves there and the caves were quite often frequented by robbers who would pounce out on, pounce out on unsuspecting travellers. So this man, he's walking on his own, he meets the, the robbers, they beat him up, they steal his clothes, they steal his possessions and leave him half dead on the side of the road. But along comes a priest. And no doubt the, the audience listening to Jesus would have thought, oh, a priest, he'll be a good man. Maybe he'll come to the rescue. But no, the priest in the story just carries on, walks down by the side of the road. But then a Levite comes by uh, a Levite is a sort of junior priest and the Levite does something similar, he just walks by. And then a Samaritan comes. Now in our culture we think a Samaritan is a good guy, but to the audience that Jesus was talking to, the Samaritan was not good. I can kind of imagine, I was wondering whether, whether the audience, when, they, when Jesus said Samaritan, they may have booed or hissed, but that's a bit pantomimish but maybe there was a bit of a low grumble. I don't know what's going to happen here. The bad guy's turned up. He'll probably finish the guy off. But actually, because the thing is, Jews and Samaritans hated each other, really badly hated each other. Uh, and uh, Jews used to think that Samaritans were almost subhuman. They referred to them as, as dogs. But actually, this Samaritan, there's a twist in the tale. Instead of doing a bad thing, the Samaritan does something amazingly good. He stops, he goes over to investigate. Uh, and that was a dangerous thing. If there were robbers in the area, he could equally well have been mugged. And he sees the man and he takes pity on him. He binds his wounds. Possibly he ripped his own clothes off in order to bind his wounds. And then he poured oil and wine on the man. Now I've done a first aid course and it doesn't say anything about pouring oil and wine on wounds, but maybe that's all he had available. And the wine, nowadays you'd think the wine, drink the wine would make him feel better, but, but he used it uh, as an antiseptic and the oil to, to soothe the pain. And then he picked the man up and stuck him on a donkey. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever tried putting a semi-conscious man on top of a donkey, but the practicalities of this are quite difficult. And I found this picture by an art, a French artist called Moreau, which illustrates the difficulties of putting a subconscious man or an unconscious man on a donkey. You can see that he's having to hold him up. It's quite an intimate, really close, Thing. They, they, were, they were very close to each other as this happened. And so he managed to, to get the guy on the donkey to an inn where he, he looked after him. And the next day he paid the innkeeper two denarii. Now historians have found what the going rate for a night at the inn is. And two denarii was equivalent to two months stay at the inn. And he said, inn, if he, if, he, if he costs more than when I come back, I will pay you more. This was love lavished on the traveller. He wasn't a friend. The Samaritan didn't know him. He was a stranger. He was a Jew that would have called the Samaritan a dog, subhuman. And yet, at great personal cost uh, and at danger of being mugged himself, this Samaritan showed lavish, lavish love. And this intimacy that you can see in the picture. He didn't just give money, 
he gave of himself. And so Jesus was using this to illustrate the importance of loving one another. But you might think, well, loving one another, that's hardly radical. Not many people disagree with that as a philosophy of life. I was reading recently about the 1960s. I was just too young to grow up in the 60s, but 1967 was the summer of love. And in America, lots of hippies would travel to the West Coast and they would, they would talk about love and the reaction to war. John Lennon and the Beatles published uh, the song, All You Need Is Love. They recognized that within love, there was a solution to the world's problems. But the 1960s hippie generation did not solve the world's problems with their love. Their love was quite hedonistic. It was drug fueled. It was quite selfish and, and self-indulgent, if you like. They weren't the first generation to think they knew better than their parents. But even they didn't live up to their own expectations. If you read about, say, the personal life of John, Level, John Lennon, it was, it was full of uh, infidelity and disappointment and so on. About that time, this Peanuts cartoon came out. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. We all know that loving people is really important. But when it comes to the crunch, People annoy us and they irritate us and we can't actually live up to the way we know that we should live up to. But in this story of the Good Samaritan, it's different. This is lavish, self-sacrificial, generous love. It steps outside the cultural norms. It takes risks. It makes sacrifices in order to bless and, uh, and look after a complete stranger. Anyway, as I said, the story of the Good Samaritan is just a story. It wasn't something that really happened, but it's a story within a story. And the outer story is something that really did happen. There was a man called Jesus who traveled around Israel and he taught and he performed miracles and people flocked to him to listen to him, to see the miracles. And the crowds, they just loved him. He was different from other religious teachers, but the establishment, and that was a religious establishment generally, they hated him, they were jealous, and they were always trying to pick holes. And this story is about uh, what Luke called an expert in the law. And in those days, there wasn't uh, secular law and religious law. This expert in the law, he was a religious person. He understood the religious law. And he asked Jesus the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What a big question this is. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy would call this the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. How can I live forever? Instead of dying and being forgotten a few years later, how can I live forever? Either my legacy or me in person, how can I live forever? Or better still, how can I live with God forever? And Jesus responded and said, well, You've studied the Old Testament, or the Testament as, as it was the Bible, the Scriptures. What do you think's in there? Uh, and uh, the Old Testament is very, very long, but this expert in the law, he picked out two things. It's like if the Highway Code, I follow the Highway Code even though I've not read it, but if you asked me to summarise it, I would say, well, it's drive carefully and don't be an idiot. But uh, summarizing the Old Testament, this, this man, he said, it's, it's love God and love your neighbor. And he qualified that, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. Now we all love ourselves, don't we? We all buy ourselves things, we feed ourselves, we look after our health and so on. And, and the Bible is saying, love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. So the teacher of the law and the Jesus say, agreed, that this, that's the answer. But then the teacher of the law, Luke says, he wanted to justify himself. So he said, well, who is my neighbor? Now, that's a strange question. And I had to think quite hard. How does asking who my neighbor is justify myself? Well, I think possibly what was going through his mind was he was thinking that Jesus would come back and say, well, God's standard's here. 
uh, and uh, you need to love your next door neighbour, you need to love the people down the road. And this teacher of the law, he thought, well, maybe I'm here and therefore I'm going to be way above the standard and therefore I can justify myself. I can say, actually, I reach God's standard and more. But Jesus told a story where the quality of the love was way up here, so far above what anybody could achieve, so far above what the, the teacher of the law could achieve. And after the story, when Jesus said, well, who do you think the neighbour was? The teacher of the law, he was so shamefaced, he, he couldn't actually say the word Samaritan. He said, the one who showed mercy. He knew that he wasn't good enough. He didn't reach the standard of love that Jesus illustrated in the story. Now this just brings me on to what is sometimes a profound misunderstanding about Christianity. Some people think that Christians are people who think they're earning their way to heaven by going to church, by singing songs, by being a do-gooder. And then somehow God will say, yeah, that's good enough and I will let you into heaven. But the lavish love of the Good Samaritan puts the light to that. None of us can hope to get anywhere close to the standard that Jesus illustrated in this story. So what hope is there? How can we get our eternal life? How can we inherit eternal life? Well, we can't by doing love. We just can't. The standard is way too high. We just have to admit that we can't do it and then throw ourselves on God's mercy. Now, there is one person who met the standards and that's Jesus. Jesus was able to tell this story because he knew he met those standards. He had spent his career caring for the sick. He had broken down cultural barriers. He had touched lepers. He had looked after the family of the occupying army, soldiers in the occupying army. And we get our, inher our eternal life because there was one person who actually met the standard of the Good Samaritan, and that's Jesus. And the amazing truth in the Bible is that we can inherit the, our eternal life on the back of Jesus' goodness. And that is a truly amazing secret that I would love to share with the world. So at the end of the passage, Jesus says, go and do likewise. But what does that actually mean? How do we actually put that into practice at the moment? Because today, if you saw someone on the side of the road, half dead, you wouldn't put them on their donkey. You would whip out your mobile phone and, and ring 999 and the emergency services would do that. Does that mean that the command's not relevant to today's society? Well, no, not at all. There are things that we can do to show lavish love. And I want to share with you five things that I have done in my life to try and obey Jesus' command to do likewise. It doesn't go anywhere near to meet the lavish love shown by the Good Samaritan. But I just want to share them uh, as examples that, that may inspire you to think about what you can do. The first thing I did was when I was a student, I decided that I would set aside a percentage of my income to give to charities. And that was easy when I was a student because I had no income, so I was setting aside no money. But as I started getting a salary and as I got salary increases, I made it a rule always to, provide, to give away this set percentage. And I gave, gave it to charities that would help people in need. Second thing I did was I have worked hard to fight the dialogue in my head. Now, our culture says, uh, now our culture uses phrases like bogus asylum seekers, benefit scroungers, stranger danger, the author of his own misfortune. They're all phrases that look at people in difficult circumstances and tend to dehumanize them, to look down on them, to make them less important. And I know that I have caught this from the culture, from, from what I've heard around me. So I have had to consciously 
reprogram the habits of my thinking. And every time I catch myself using those or looking down at people, I realize, I remember to myself that these are people that God has made, that God loves, and he's instructed me to love. And therefore, I work hard on it. I have a lot of pet peeves. I hate it when people hog the middle lane of a motorway. I hate people who play loud music in parks when I'm trying to, to relax. I get irritated by people who go shopping without a face covering, which is the worst crime. But I have taught myself to stop looking down on them and say there must be reasons. And there are reasons why people do these things and they're people that God loves. It's an ongoing battle to fight the dialogue in my head, but I keep trying to do it. The third thing I've done, and this is consciously, I have tried to engage with people I see on the street who are in need, people who are beggars, people who sell the big issue, people who may be lying there with their sleeping bag. See, I used to think, oh, well, I give money to charity. I don't need to give money uh, to people on the street. I don't know what it's going to be spent on. But then I realized that that was, attitude was actually hardening my heart somewhat. So I've now got the habit of, of having some cash with me. And if I see someone selling the big issue or asking for money, then I will use that money that I have and give it to them. But I don't just give, I also chat. How long have you been doing this? How come you're in this situation? Uh, and although the first couple of times it's scary, actually it's very rewarding. I've learned that there is a person and a story, often a sad story of broken relationship behind these people. Interesting fact that I've discovered talking to big issue sellers is they don't do very well in Chalfont St. Peter. Most people walk by them, which is a bit sad. Fourth thing I've done is I've educated myself. I read material about the less fortunate people. You see, I've grown up in South Buckinghamshire. We're really well off. We're a well off part of the country and a well off part of the world. But this isn't normal for the world. And so I've educated myself. I buy the Big Issue magazine and I read, read it. I've signed up for emails from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation that look at causes of poverty. I've read the report of Philip Alston. He's a, a UN person who came here a couple of years ago and documented the impact of austerity policies on the people of the UK. I've got out of the echo chamber of people who think uh, and talk like I do and listened uh, to other voices. And then the fifth thing that I've done along with my wife is we have used our home to offer hospitality to people in need. Currently it's to, to vulnerable children who can't live with their own parents. Uh, so we've become approved foster carers. And um, that's a way that we have met a huge wide range of, of people in need and uh, have been able to bless them with, with our home. So these are just examples and you may be sitting there thinking, big deal. If you're in a, a caring profession, a nurse or a doctor, you might think, well, I've, I've given my career to that, while you, Steve, you've, you've worked in financial services, making money for people. But I'm not saying these things to show off or, or to say, look how good I am. I'm just saying there are opportunities in the world to follow the example of the Good Samaritan. And in coming months, there's going to be a tsunami of opportunities as, as people get sick, as people lose their jobs, uh, uh, as lockdown seems to be coming back to us. Now, some people are naturally empathetic. Maybe you grew up and you, you wanted to be a nurse because you're naturally empathetic or sympathetic to other people. I'm not naturally empathetic, I've decided. I have to actually work hard to be empathetic. But that doesn't let me off the hook. Jesus still wants me to love other people. So what's been the impact of these changes? Well, some of it's been quite costly. We've had broken nights with children waking us up. Uh, we've been lied to. Uh, when we've been generous to someone, they've come back to us and asked for us for more money, which puts us in an awkward position. Some of our property has been damaged or stolen. My wife actually broke her foot 
as a result of fostering. We've probably given money, some of which has been used for alcohol or, or, or other not good purposes. So it's not all a bed of roses, but the benefits are huge. Look at that picture by Moreau again. Do you see the two men? Do you see the intimacy between them? They're really close up and personal. And we've benefited from getting to know some amazing people. Jesus said somewhere that what you do for the poor, you do for Jesus. And as we've drawn close to needy people and shown them love, it's been an opportunity to draw close to Jesus. And that's one of the best things you can do in your life is draw close to God through Jesus. Now at Gold Hill, we, we have great times of worship and I know a lot of people love singing uh, and that's an opportunity for drawing close to Jesus. But for me, that's only half the story. For me, reaching out, doing what he tells us to do in loving other people, that's a, a stronger, deeper way of drawing close to him. Something that's always puzzled me is that some churches seem to have a tension between their worship and their social action. Should we spend our time in, in the building, praying and worshipping uh, uh, and singing and having meetings, or should we go out and, and do stuff that benefits, for, benefits society? For me, I don't see the, the dilemma, I don't see the tension. For me, social action is worship. They're two sides of the same coin. Love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind and love your neighbour as yourself. Two halves of the same coin. As I help God's children, I draw closer to God. Do you want to draw closer to Jesus? There's a song, I want to see Jesus. Well, I tell you, one of the ways you can see Jesus is to look in the eyes of a needy person and help them. Well, you may be thinking, yes, but Jesus, in that Samaritan story, he sets such a high standard, we can't possibly meet it. If I go all out to help other people, first of all, I'm going to fail, and secondly, I'll burn out. I'm fallible. I'm only human. But the good news is that if we just admit that we're fallible and human, and as I said earlier, throw ourselves on God's mercy, then God makes an amazing promise he, to us. He promises to fill us with his Holy Spirit. He promises to make us more like Jesus. He promises to give us the power to actually put into practice what he asks us to do. I just get so excited by God's strategy. He builds a church and there are hundreds of people in this area in Chalfont who can be devoted to loving our neighbours as ourselves, not in our own strength, but empowered by God. I think there are about 350 people who generally watch the services on YouTube. Imagine all 350 of them going out and looking for needy people in God's strength and blessing, blessing our neighbours. But we're not just on our own. As individuals, we're part of a community, a church. This church runs food banks. It provides financial counselling. It's going to provide support with mental health. In, in, the, um, in the bread house, it provides a, a place to chat. In Unique Like You, it provides a place for people to explore their creative side and, uh, and to, to, to receive love and therapy through creativity. We're part of an amazing organisation. And that's not just in Chalfont St Peter, it's in every town and village in the UK. And it's not just in the UK, it's throughout the world. So my question to you today is, do you want to be part of this movement that can actually change the world? A movement of love where we see needs and we respond to them in God's strength. And that invitation is open to everyone, whether you've been a Christian for years or whether you're not a Christian at all. Come and join God's movement of love. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, that you taught the parable of the Good Samaritan. Thank you, there it is an example to us, an inspiration to us. And we pray that each one of us here today would find out how you want us practically, in our own unique way, using our own unique gifting, to love 
our neighbours as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand When I trust you I don't need to understand So make Make me your vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be Oh, I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me Oh, bring your new wine out of me, Jesus In the crushing in the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. You are breaking new ground So make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be Oh, I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me, oh, Jesus, bring new wine out of me, Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine out of me, because where there is new wine, there is new power. There is new freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flames to carry on new fire today. Where there is, where there is new wine, there is new power. Freedom and the kingdom is here. I lay down my own flame to carry your new fire today. Oh, make me a vessel. Oh
Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Oh, thank you, Steve. They were challenging words and great words. What would it look like if all 350 people watching this online were actually to go out into their communities in the way that the Good Samaritan went out? We would have such an impact. So let's encourage one another on. Let's inspire one another. Let's help one another. But let us individually, intentionally, look for ways that we can really go out and help people around us. And like Steve said, we are moving into a time, quite possibly, where there will be more and more obvious signs of need around us because of the lockdown that's been, because of a potential lockdown to come. Let us seize this opportunity to go and show the love of Jesus to our friends and neighbours and family that might be really struggling through this time because we know that we have got the one true hope, Jesus. If you um, want anyone to pray with you, if you feel that you would like to talk to somebody, then please don't hesitate to contact us. And again, the details are on our website, or you can come to the church. There's normally somebody at the church in person. If you want to um, just talk something through with someone, there's plenty of people who would be very happy and willing to meet up with you, to encourage you, to help you, to inspire you. But Lord, for those of us who are really seeking to do your will, I pray today that you would inspire us and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, um, that we would actually be able to go out in confidence and in power to take the love of Jesus into our communities. So I'd like to bless you as you switch off, as you go back to whatever it was you were going to do for the rest of this day. But think about this message. Think about how wonderful it is having Jesus in your own life. And ask God to give you a real passion to go and share that hope and that assurance with those around us. Bless you. <laughs>